All right, welcome back to another Footy and Coffee Conversations. Um, for those of you that watched it on Instagram, we're redoing it now because the audio had some difficulties. Uh, so, yeah, let's jump into it. You have coffee? You, you drink it? You travel one today. Oh, travel mug. Is it uh, any cream? Um, same as last time, just a little bit of half and half, a little cream, and that's about it. Have you, have you tried it black or you just can't? Yeah, I like it black. Um, but I feel like when I want a little something in it, you know, I, that's my go-to. But um, I first started drinking coffee uh, when I went over to seas to Germany to play for Bayern Munich. I didn't drink coffee at all in college. Oh, wow. And then wow. obviously being in, in Europe, I feel like coffee is just like a necessity, you know, after lunch or whatever. So, um I had to use a lot of sugar in the beginning, uh, but now I can I can drink a black. Yeah, that is true. In Europe, they they treat coffee like water. Yeah. Uh, so just to get started, if you want to introduce yourself, obviously you're not playing now, um, but introduce yourself. What position that you were on the field when you did play? Yeah, my name is Sarah Hagen. Um, I was a center forward for the most part um, for my entire professional. Um, and pretty much my entire collegiate career, um, pretty much back to goal kind of forward. I'm 5'11", so um, had a lot of success in the air. Did, uh, did you ever play other positions growing up in youth soccer? Um, in youth soccer, I started out as pretty much anywhere in the back line. Um, I played on a boys team, U11, U12. Um, yeah, I was pretty much... Uh, the best defender and then all of a sudden when I wanted to switch over to girls I went to play a year up to get some better competition it was about two hours south of where I grew up um, and they kind of had me try out in more of an attacking position uh, and that's kind of where I found that I can score <laughs> um, and so um, yeah U13, 14, even 15 I was playing uh, forward, and then my junior and senior year of high school, my club coach put me at center midfield, um, and I really struggled with with the pace of that, um, you know, just the transition. And um, but then once I got back to college, I was, um, you know, back up top scoring goals. Yeah, that's a that's a difficult to switch from a striker to a midfielder. It's completely different the way you receive the ball and everything. Yeah, different mindset, but again, I, I mean, it made me a better player. I started understanding how to shape my runs as a forward, timing, um, what gaps to look for the ball. So it, it, while it was a struggle, it, it did make me a better player. In the long run, it turned out, turned out good. Um, yeah. To start, if you want to just tell us what your – everyone on the soccer field calls you Apple. What is, what is the nickname behind that story? Yeah, so when I was switching over to that girls team about two hours south, um, they already had two Sarahs on the team. So uh, one of the parents just started calling me Appleton because I'm from, from Appleton. Um, and all of a sudden it just became Apple. And it's, I mean, it's stuck with me. I got the nickname in sixth grade. Um, it's carried all the way through uh, to my, my time in Germany with Bayern Munich, with the national team, U.S. League. Um, so it's really lasted a long time and uh if anyone calls you sarah on the field are you confused uh yeah i don't really respond um i mean now that i've been retired for two years i don't get called apple a, a ton um but yeah in the soccer environment if i talk to old teammates um it's always apple it's never sarah do you like sarah now or you kind of miss the apple uh i miss the apple i mean i'm I still keep in pretty good contact with a bunch of my, um, you know, old teammates and um, you know, all my college friends call me Apple because, um, again, that was mainly soccer related. So, um, yeah, I do miss being called it. It's kind of like my alter ego, I guess, my second ident identity. Um, so growing up, you, you just talked about how you uh, were, were training, playing for a club two hours away. Uh, so obviously soccer was important enough for you at that, even at that young of an age to be willing to travel. Uh, when did, when was it that soccer was like, this is the thing I want to do? Um, 
I mean, growing up, I always had, I was very talented. Um, I, I didn't actually enjoy playing soccer when I first started. I guess I hated it. Um, you know, back when I was like five or six years old, my parents said, you know, what, wait for your first game. If you still don't like it, we'll let you move on. Um, I scored a goal um, and came running off the field with a huge smile on my face. Loved it ever since. Um, you know, and then I just started really putting a lot of time and effort into it. You know, my parents kind of pushed me outside of comfort zones, going to camps, um, playing on teams. You know, I remember when I, was, when I first got started with the boys team, I was playing and one of the dads on the other team was like, oh, we got to get this girl, this kid on our, on our team. And so that kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone, joining a more competitive team. And then really, um, when I really wanted to like pursue it as like, hey, I want to get to college. Um, I mean, it was pretty early on. I just did a little short uh, conversation and interview with Brandy Chastain, actually. Um, on BBC. And so that was really cool because she was my idol growing up and my, my inspiration to pursue my dreams as becoming a professional athlete and professional soccer player. Um, she had given me a, a little car that said dreams do come true. And just those words um, coming from her, someone who was such an icon in women's soccer at the time was all that I needed to really dive deep into pursuing that dream. Very cool. Yeah, my idol was Michelle Akers, so. Yeah, I mean, my hair is probably more like Michelle Akers. I got all the curls, but um, yeah, she was pretty, she was a boss. She was a boss, yeah. Um, so talk about high school soccer as you're taking it more serious, heading into college. What does that look like for you? Um, yeah, high school. I mean, I, I really enjoyed high school soccer. Um, I don't think it necessarily prepped me for college. Uh, that was more so club. But high school soccer kind of brought back that joy, you know, playing with um, new players, um, you know, having the rivalries at school. Um, it also allowed me to, um, you know, just kind of refresh and, and refocus on what my goal was. And, um, you know, getting to the collegiate level, I was going to school an hour and a half away after college. So um, it was my decision to go to UW-Milwaukee was something very comfortable. Um, I knew a bunch of the girls who were already committed there who were, you know, on my club team when I was playing up. So, um, you know, my coach at UW Milwaukee was also my ODP coach. So the whole decision to go to UW Milwaukee was very comfortable. Um, but again, it, it allowed me to, um, really develop as a player and it really pushed me to become a better player. Yeah, your was it your senior year of high school? You had thirty three goals. So, uh, yeah, it could be. Um, I I don't remember my high school stats, um, but again, it was just it was something that I, I mean, I had success, but again, how do you really put that in comparison to what um, what it takes to get to that next level? Because you know there are players all throughout each state who you know you know are at, at the top of you know, the, the pool of players, but how do you really judge if you're going to make an impact at the next level? And so for high school, like I said, it was just more so the joy. I didn't focus about, you know, how many goals that's going to score. You know, it was just cool to be in, you know, moments, you know, going to state, the state finals or going to the state tournament with players who may not have had opportunity um, if it wasn't like a part of the impact that I was able to have on that team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you had, you had a little bit, different of a of a high school experience than the average um soccer player had um how did that shape you as a player what was that like trying to um battle cancer and also you know be a soccer player and start working towards college yeah that um being diagnosed with cancer as as a freshman in high school was pretty difficult pretty challenging um really more so the men the mental side of it trying to figure out why i had to be dealing with this and no one else had to um but i mean when you think about it most kids freshman year your new school bigger surroundings you're just trying to um try and fit in and then i you know i didn't go to school my whole second half of the of the school year um i mean just up until before i was diagnosed the weekend before i was at purdue university for an odp event 
Um, so I was st still competing and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm sidelined and in the hospital receiving chemo. And so um, that really tested my, um, I mean, I, it, it just made me put a lot of things in perspective. Um, I, I know for 100%, um, I'm 100% certain that I would not have gotten through all of that without um, my friends, my family, the support of my, you know, club teams, high school teammates, just high school kids in general, teachers. Um, it was really cool to see, you know, that support and, and kind of how they took my mind off of, you know, going in for treatment or going in for surgery and, and seeing my parents struggle with it. You know, me being an only child, you know, I'm all that my parents had. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was very difficult to kind of grasp at the time, but without being positive and having that support, I wouldn't have gotten through it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it, uh, <clears throat> at the same time has played a big role in your soccer career of being able to, uh, deal with, you know, challenges in the soccer arena because nothing compares on the field to something like that. And the fact that you were able to at 15, you know, stay strong and fight through something like that is incredible. Um, you go, you go to UW, Milwaukee. Are you looking at other schools? Obviously that's close to home. Were you looking at going anywhere farther away? Um, I had a few other options, nothing, worthy of really mentioning like you know like a Stanford or a FSU or anything like that um I was pretty much under the radar obviously my whole freshman year I was out with cancer um getting back to it getting back to soccer after that I was a completely different person completely different player um my freshman year when I was going through cancer I was only 5'3 maybe like 115 pounds and now or throughout from freshman year to senior year, I grew eight inches and I'm now 5'11". So um, completely different player. I mean, I was just a little, um, yeah, 5'3", little Energizer bunny um, running around. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm 5'11", trying to deal with this new body type and figure out how I'm, you know, how to move on the field. And so when I was getting recruited, I didn't, I wasn't comfortable with my body. I wasn't fit. Um, things that came easy for me before that were a lot harder, um, a year, two, three years later. So it took some getting used to, um, but like you mentioned, um, you know, when I look back to my college times and once I started finding my own and having more success, you keep all that in perspective, you know, going in for chemo is a lot harder than running one twenties on the, on the soccer field. So, um, yeah, it definitely made me put things in perspective and, and, and really challenge myself and push myself harder. Yeah. So you get you get to Milwaukee. Um, newsflash, you excelled at it. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, you just got put into the Hall of Fame there. Um, a lot of success. I know Horizon Player of the Week, I think 15 different times, which is like nine times more than any other player had won it. You had what 93 goals and 26 assists in your career which is for goals is at I think ninth all time in the division one record at the time um talk about your your growth from coming in as a freshman you're still kind of gaining your confidence and who you are as a player in the new body to then you know growing and becoming the player that you became by senior year yeah so I mean like I mentioned freshman year um again I'm my focus is to all right, how can I get minutes? How can I make an impact on the team? Um, you know, luckily, you know, I worked hard during preseason, um, was able to get an opportunity early on, um, scored a few goals in my, you know, one of my first games. And pretty much from there on out, um, you know, as, you know, game, game after game after game, having some goals, building some confidence, um, it just was kind of like a steamroll effect. It just throughout that whole first year, um, you know, finishing with 20 some goals, it's, it definitely made me realize like, Hey, I belong here. Um, so going into my next season, my next three seasons, it really kind of set that bar. Um, all right. This is what I was able to accomplish my first year. How do I keep pace with that and, and keep pushing myself to get better? Um, because, you know, as my college career started, you know, uh, developing, I started realizing that, hey, 
playing at the next level, playing professionally is something that is a real, is a reality. And so, um, you know, when I look back at my time at UWM, it was how can I um, perfect my craft? How can I sharpen all, you know, the little aspects of my, of my game? Um, and, and that's really, as the years went on, it, that's what my main focus was. Was there any thought, um, any of those years of trying to transfer to, you know, one of these big names universities? Um, yeah, and only just, just for the, the, he the heck of it, really, just to kind of um, have fun with the idea of it. You know, when I started getting called into youth national team camps um, and, and playing with girls from all over the country at all different colleges, you build friendships, obviously, and you kind of joke around like, oh, maybe I should transfer to Notre Dame and play with Melissa Henderson and, and stuff like that, but nothing serious. And I had an absolute blast playing at UW-Milwaukee. Um, yes, it's a smaller Division I school, um, but, I mean, the way that we were able to kind of put that school on the map for the years that I was there um, and, you know, kind of – really maximize the the potential and the talent that we were able to get there um it was something really f special to be a part of and, and you know the friendships that i made there um it i i really couldn't have asked for a better experience yeah and i think too um when you go to a little bit smaller of a school or not as you know star studded so to speak uh your impact at the school is a lot longer you know, if you go to a huge school with, with that's producing professional players every year, mm -hmm. unless you're the star of the star of that group, you know, right. they don't know you when you come back. Coaches are still, I'm sure, talking about you and what you did at the school all these years later. So I think that's a cool experience, too, with a smaller school. Um, in, in university, you start getting some national team. You play uh, the U-20, Four Nations cup uh so now you're you're playing with the best of the best of your age women's soccer players uh how is that experience was that um confidence building in the fact that you were able to i think you scored every game of the tournament um you you were starting to see although you were at a smaller school you were able to compete with all of them yeah um you know first getting invited into those youth national team camps um a lot of those girls have been getting called in to youth national team camps you know since they were 15 16 years old um i was really kind of a late call in you know just for my first few years in college having success and so getting called in and having girls from you know notre dame and fsu and virginia and stanford and then, you know, you say, hey, hi, I'm Sarah Hagan I'm from UW-Milwaukee. Everyone's like, well, where's that? And so it was, a, you know, it was a little intimidating. But, you know, after a few camps getting called in, a few practices under my feet, um, you start realizing that, you know, I, I, I deserve to be there. I was fitting in. It wasn't something out of my league. And so, um, yeah, going into that Four Nations tournament, I think you can kind of see that with the success that I did have, it, you know, it was a – correlation to my confidence um, and just kind of being in with that group longer and longer. Um, you know, the youth national team camps were, were something that really helped me going back to UWM and having more confidence and going up against some of these bigger schools like Ohio State or um, Notre Dame and, and kind of gave me, you know what, hey, I go into camp and I play with these, these girls all the time. I can, you know, with my teammates at UWM, we can go in and and play against a, a Purdue University or something like that. Yeah. I mean, and no matter what, I remember one coach said to me, uh, you know, every player has to put one shoe on and then the next shoe. So at the end of the day, a player's a player, no matter yep. what, uh, what school they're wearing on their shirt. Um, so then I think, it's, I think it's ironic. You pick a school hour and a half from home real close, and then you – enter the professional world and decide to go halfway across the world to Germany. Um, what, how did that kind of come to, to pass? And what was that experience like playing for Bayern Munich in Germany? Um, well, first off, that, that decision to go over to, to Bayern Munich was the best decision of my entire life. Um, it was a decision that, in my opinion, at the time was very risky, very not it was very out of the norm for me um 
the kind of the deciding factors between or behind all of that was um, my college coaches knew an agent who's based out of uh, Germany actually, and we created this highlight tape, highlight video of all you know me scoring goals and whatnot, and they sent it over to a bunch of different clubs over in Europe. Um, at the time, the WPS was looking a little shaky. My college coaches were like, we really think that you should um, kind of pursue the overseas thing for right now. And so Bayern was one of the school or one of the, the, the teams that responded and gave me an offer. And um, I actually said no at first, which looking back was, I'm just happy that they came back with a better offer because um, like I said, it was the best decision I've ever made. Um, a, a month, I believe, a month into my decision and my time over at Bayern, um, the U.S. League folded. And so it ended up being an even better decision. Um, but, yeah, playing for a, a club like Bayern Munich um, was, was something truly special. What's that like, That those first couple of trainings you walk in, you're hearing a bunch of German, you don't know any German at that time. Obviously, you know, in, in training sessions, you can kind of – watch what people are doing and fit in. But I would imagine more uh, the locker room and things like that is, is challenging when you first enter. Yeah, um, obviously I knew that language was gonna be an issue. Uh, luckily when I agreed to go over to Bayern, uh, I was going over with another American at the same time. Uh, Nikki Cross played for the Boston Breakers um, at the time. Um, she had played overseas before in Sweden and Australia. so. She had done the international experience. I knew that I was gonna have someone to speak English with. So um, that definitely eased my mind a lot. But yeah, showing up for that first practice and um, I mean, it really it hit me hard. I was like, oh my gosh, this is something totally not used to, you know, our living arrangement. I mean, just your immersion in a completely different um, culture. Mm -hmm. um, like you mentioned the, yeah, the locker room talk and going out to team dinners um, you kind of felt bad asking them to translate everything. Um, but, you know, over time, I, I mean, luckily I was there for two and a half years, so I did pick up the language. So, you know, by the end of my time there, I didn't have to constantly be asking, what are you guys talking about? Because I could pick up things. Um, but German is a very your, important language. What's your proficiency in German? Um, right now, I mean, it's been probably six years since I've been there. Um, it's probably not very great. Um, I don't know if it was ever really great, <laughs> to be honest. Um, like I said, it's a very difficult language. And, you know, I felt, I felt like if I actually knew, like if there was a sentence I had to say and I would say it, like they wouldn't understand it. But I, I mean, it was, it was just really difficult for me to speak it. I mean, I could hear it and understand it, but getting it out was a whole nother story. Yeah, that's, that's my, uh, my same thoughts on Swedish. Like I can understand and hear a lot. And then I try to say it and my mouth just doesn't move to pronounce or make the sounds necessary. Um, so you're playing in Germany, obviously for worldwide, one of the most historic clubs. Uh, so that's a pretty cool experience. Uh, being in Germany, you guys have Oktoberfest. I assume you guys participated in that in some way. Yeah, um, so that was pretty cool. I mean, obviously you hear about it. Um, Wisconsin actually has a, a large uh, German um, population. Um, my, I have a lot of German background in, in me. And so to be over there and to kind of experience for the first time, you know, in person, it was, it was so cool. Um, we got fitted for the dirndls, for the, the dresses. Um, you know, went to one of the, the big tents with the men's team and, and celebrate with a big, you know, big beer and some schnitzel and, and whatnot. So um, that was pretty cool. Um, our coach always had to prep us before, um, make sure that no one went too crazy during it. Uh, I had no idea that it was three, almost a month long. Um, I thought it was just like a week long celebration, but uh, yeah, so we had to be a little bit careful about um, you know, behaving ourselves, I guess. But, but you did, you, you're still here. So that's good. Yep. I made it out alive. Now also, um, you were discussing with your, your teammates about a food that you enjoy cupcakes, which they do not have over there. Um, 
what was that conversation like? How did they uh, react to when you decided to bring cupcakes into the locker room? Yeah, I mean, I don't even remember how it all got started other than the fact that they had never heard of cupcakes. And so I think I first started off with just like a, a funfetti mix, made some cupcakes and everyone loved them. Um, and so then from there on out, it was like, all right, every celebration, every birthday, I had to bring in cupcakes. And so I kind of started getting more and more creative um, over, the, over the, the years. And you would make Kit Kat cupcakes and cookies and cream cupcakes, Irish, um, like Bailey's Irish cream cupcakes. And um, it was just something fun that, you know, I could kind of create for the girls and you know when I first came back to the states for Kansas City some of my teammates um had known that I had been doing that and were like you need to carry on the tradition yeah that's uh I'm sure they were sad to leave, see you leave Germany not just for your play on the field but but also for the cupcakes yeah uh, I'm sure you you uh we spoke last time about the uh, game you played in that was kind of the the biggest game in Germany for you and that experience. Uh, do you just want to describe that atmosphere for us? Yeah, so early on in my time at Bayern, um, we had qualified for the German Pokal, the cup final. Um, we were playing against Frankfurt. Um, and at that time, that was the biggest game of my entire life. Um, we were complete underdogs. Our, um, our, one of our best players tore ACL, and then the very next practice, our captain tore ACL. Um, and so back-to-back -back practices with you know, ACL tears, this is like a month leading up to the cup final. Mentally, we were not, um, not great. And so going into that game as being underdogs without two of our best players, um, there's a lot of uncertainty but we were able to step up to the, the challenge. Uh, we ended up winning 2-0. Um, I had the first goal and assisted on the second. Um, the the first, goal, first goal came off of a corner kick. Um, my, my, my role for the corner kick for the set piece was pretty much stand at the near post. As soon as the ball is crossed in, pop off that near post right about where the six yard box is and, and head it in and our our outside back who was taking the corner kick at the time placed the ball like perfect, perfect cross in. Um, so all I had to really do is just redirect it. And um, yeah, probably the biggest goal of my entire career. What was the celebration after that goal? Um, I don't know. To be honest, there was like 17,000 fans and I um, had never played in front of that. So I think I probably just like locked out. Um, I think we all just kind of like went storming back towards the bench. Maybe I, I don't even remember to be honest. It's too, too exciting of a moment. You don't even remember it. Yeah. Uh, so you eventually decide uh, to leave Germany and head back uh, to play in the U S uh, was that a difficult decision? How did you decide coming back to the U S this time now? Um, yeah, that was a extremely difficult decision. I think mentally I, I was burnt out of living overseas. Um, you know, I think last time we, we spoke about how when I left UW Milwaukee to go over to Germany, um, I had just gone home for, for Christmas break um, after exams and like eight to 10 days later, I'm jumping on a plane to fly to Germany um, to start my professional career. I didn't move out of my housing. Um, so I felt like that chapter of my life had never officially been closed. And so after two and a half years of playing overseas, um, I was like, I need to get back. I feel like I, I, I just need to kind of get back to the U S and, and see that everything's okay. Um, I was also getting called into the U S national the full team at that time. So I felt like eh, it might be a good opportunity for me to get some more exposure, um, you know, with some of the U.S. girls in front of uh, Jill Ellis. Um, and so that, I mean, it, it was a difficult decision. I remember the bus ride after my last game with Bayern. Uh, we all got back to the, our locker room and, you know, everyone's crying. And, you know, when you, when you leave a team in the U.S., you know, you're just a short flight away from people. You're still going to be playing the same league. And um, when I left Germany, I didn't know if I was going to see any of those players ever again. Um, and so, and some of them I haven't. So it, it was, it was a very difficult decision, but in my mind, I, I know it was the right one. 
Yeah. So you you come back and you uh, are playing for Kansas City. What what now is U.S. soccer like? Uh, the women's league now, because obviously you leave. There, there's uncertainty now. You come back. The league is a lot different. Um, what was kind of your initial reaction being back in the U.S. versus playing in in Germany? Um, yeah, so when I joined the U.S. League again, it's like I have never actually played in that league, so I don't know how it's going to compare to Bundesliga. Um, all I knew for professional women's soccer was the Bundesliga, so, um, you know, am I going to fit in? And I got some some minutes early on, scored some goals with Kansas City, um, and then going into my second year, I, I didn't get as much playing time. Um, you know, I luckily with Kansas City, it – you know, playing under Vladko and, and playing with a lot of national team players and just a good group of girls. I had a, a ton of fun. Um, we were able to win two championships there while I was there. Um, so, I mean, I probably couldn't have asked for a better environment to kind of come back to the States for. Yeah. Do you think the cupcakes had anything to do with that, the winning the championships? You know, it, it might have. A um, little incentive, yeah. Hey, team chemistry is never a bad thing. <laughs> um, so then <laughs> Kansas City, you end up uh, being one of the initial signings with Orlando Pride. Uh, what, what is that experience? You're going to a new club. Um, you know, you go from playing for Bayern Munich, which is historic years and years of history, to now, hey, we're starting a new club in a fairly new league. Um, you know, there's not the same team identity, club identity. Uh, how challenging is that coming in? How exciting is that? What's kind of your thought process heading into that? Yeah, so leaving Kansas City and um, being one of the first few faces for Orlando was extremely exciting. Um, you could definitely tell that, that the city of Orlando was dying to have a women's professional team um and there was so much hype i mean obviously you had a men's team joining the mls just the year before um so soccer was really you know up and coming in that area um you know being a part of that club they did everything the right way um you know housing was was what was deserving of and having team meals and um having a locker room the facilities the doctors i mean everything was up to standards and, and what needed to be um, that wasn't really like what most of the clubs in the NWSL um, were at. Yeah. Yeah. I've always been impressed with the, the level of professionalism in Orlando. Uh, what's it like playing in Orlando, the swamp heat going from playing German football that can be quite cold at times to now you're playing in just ridiculously hot humid area is that challenging for you um yeah it was extremely challenging for me um i mean like i said i'm from uh, wisconsin obviously very cold when i was you know to germany pretty similar weather um and then kansas city was probably the warmest i had played in um but when you compare it to places like Orlando and Houston that I've played in um, doesn't even compare. So um, that definitely took some getting used to uh, when you wake up at eight in the morning and going off to practice and you're just dripping walking, you know, to your car. Um, obviously hydration becomes a huge um, kind of importance and, and you really stress that during uh, just everyday life as a athlete performing outside. So, yeah, but at least when you're done with training, it's a uh, nice weather. Not so much during, but after training, it's good. That is true. Um, after Afterwards, it's nice to be outside and, and enjoying some sunshine and, and some warm weather. So then you, you end up going to, to Houston Dash. Talk about that uh, transition from Orlando to Houston. Um, yeah, so that transition was something that I didn't want to happen. Uh, I got cut from the Orlando Pride. Um, really... When I look back, you know, I'm, I've been retired for two, for two years now. Um, when I really process that, that entire um, part of my career, um, you know, it was something I really struggled with. Up until that point, I'd never been cut from a team. I had never 
really face any sort of adversity. Um, and so I didn't know how to handle it. Um, I went into Houston, you know, very uncertain and very unsure of um, my abilities. And, you know, I try to tell players, youth players now since I retired, you know, don't let one coach's opinion of you um, judge or make you perceive yourself differently. Um, I wish I would have, you know, I did use it to feel myself to, you know, try and prove people wrong and to, to work harder and, and to get back. But at the same time, I really let it eat, at, eat away at myself. Um, you know, I, I think we also talked about how, I mean, just two years before that, I was getting called into the you know national team and all of a sudden I'm getting cut from an NWSL roster. And so um, I think just going from the highs of highs to lows of lows, um, it was something very challenging for me to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that's not how anyone uh, expects it to kind of end, especially two years earlier being with the national team. Um, what, what did you find during that time? Because I, I think it's important as a, as a player to find like a way to get your mind off of what's happening on the field. Uh, if you just constantly sit in it, whether good or bad, it'll just eat you alive. Like you need to have separation from the field and kind of get away. What did you find at that time to have as a support system and just kind of get your mind off of football? Yeah. Um, my time in Houston, I did a lot of drawing. Um, I'm in a, I just finished my degree last year, drawing and painting major. Um, so I, I just finished that, spent a lot of time at coffee shops, just drawing um, to take my mind off of it. Uh, one of my teammates at the time uh, was finishing her master's degree um, and so, you know, while she was working on that, I would go and, and start drawing and, and just kind of let my mind um, free and, and on something else besides soccer. I like it. What, what kind of drawing is your, your forte? Um, I do, do a lot of um, black and white kind of work, a lot of ink work. Um, I also do a lot of charcoal drawings. Um, I haven't done a ton of art in the last six months. Um, but uh, I did start up a, an online business shortly after my time with Houston. Uh, it's my online store is no longer up and running, um, which might be something I should get back, get back to. Um, just been a lot of moving pieces since I retired in my life. Um, obviously finishing my degree and, and kind of finding my, my role and my, myself um, in the business world now. So what, uh, what, what type of things did you draw? Or do you like drawing? Um, I kind of just did a bunch of like, I don't know if you would really say doodles. Um, I don't know if you describe my work. It's not like realistic at all. Um, I've done a lot of tattoo drawings um, for mm -hmm. former teammates, um, both college and professional. Some fans have asked for some tattoo ideas. So, um, I've done some, some stuff for auctions. Um, How yeah. did tattoos turn out? Good. Um, yeah, I think I think pretty good. Uh, I've done one for one of my college teammates. I did a son. Um, one of the Dash players, I, I drew a tattoo for her arm. So um, I think they turned out good. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so going back, uh, talking about the U.S. women's national team. Uh, every every player dreams of representing uh, their their club or their country at the senior level. Uh, what's it like when you get that first um, call that hey, we want you to come into the senior camp? Um, well, first off, I mean, you just you pretty much get an email asking you if you can make these dates for the for the camp. And Did you think I was, it was fake? I I thought it was completely fake. I was like, wait, you know. Cause I have been receiving the emails for the, the, the U23 national team. And all of a sudden it's, I'm like, am I reading this right? Is this like legit? Um, and it was like, oh my gosh, this is the, this is the day that I've been waiting for from my entire life. And um, it was an unbelievable feeling, um, you know, getting into camp, getting in, having my first cap in Portugal um, was pretty remarkable. I mean, I, I can't even describe the feeling when you have that U.S. crest 
um, on your on your shirt. It's um, it's like a, a, a huge feeling of accomplishment, a huge feeling of pride. Um, and I want to, you know, have asked a better way to do it. Yeah. What, what's it like the, the first day of practice you come in, a lot of these women have been training together. They, they are, you know, been playing years together on the national team. You come in, you're coming in and essentially you're there to take somebody's spot that's been there longer. Um, what's the, the reception? Is there any self doubt when you first walk in there? Kind of what's, what's going through your mind? Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of, it kind of reminded me of, you know, walking into the U23 camp, you know, I'm just a, a player from UW-Milwaukee, I have all these other girls from Stanford and all other schools, only it's just so much more heightened with the full team, right? You have players who have played in World Cups and Olympics, and again, you're just someone who's, um, you know, playing uh, just out of college, play, you know, first few professional seasons, and so... Uh, there was a lot of doubt, and you see all these big faces, Hope Solo and Carly Lloyd and um, Lauren Chaney, and it's, um, it's, it's very intimidating. Uh, I think I probably didn't assert myself enough um, in that surrounding. You know, like, I've always been a very um, kind of more shy person, uh, not super, uh, you know, going on my way to – to be in front of larger groups. And so I was very timid going into that kind of experience. And looking back, I wish I would have um, kind of left my mark a little bit more. Um, but again, I think a lot of it has to do with timing. Um, I just don't know if it was the best timing for, for, for me. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's it's not like you can say, no, I'm, I'm good, I won't come in. I think I need to wait yeah. for this to open up or whatever, you know. Uh, what's your what's your favorite experience from your your time with the national team? Um, obviously, my first cap. Um, we were in Portugal for the Algarve Cup. Uh, I got to sub on the field for Abby Wambach, so um, a great player to to kind of go in for. Um, I think I mentioned for whatever reason the kit man had given me Alex Morgan's number, and so. I answered the field and, and she obviously she wasn't at the, the tournament, but everyone on social media was like hating on me after that. They're like, who is this girl wearing, wearing Alex Morgan's jersey? Um, but I almost I almost scored a goal in my first game. Um, There's a ball being played across the box. I slid in near post run, just missed time the run. I was probably, you know, a foot away from actually getting my, my foot on to score, but um, yeah, pretty cool experience. Again, you're not, I, we weren't playing in front of thousands and thousands of fans, uh, a very low key kind of game to kind of into, which probably was better for me. Um, uh, I think I only got like 10 minutes, but, um, nonetheless, it was such a cool experience. And I, I can see you're not bothered at all by, by the run into the box and, you know, don't think about uh, it anymore. <laughs> I know. No, I'm like, oh, if I would have just scored that goal, maybe things would have been different. But yeah, I mean, again, it is what it is. Um, I definitely remember that moment. But um, yeah, I mean, not many people get to say they've been up to that level. So yeah, I mean, that's the that's the dream right there. And you accomplished it. So can't really be uh, too upset at that. I'm sure there's millions of, of women that are quite jealous of your opportunity with that. Um, so then going to the end of your career, you decide to, to hang up the boots. It's never an easy decision. It never probably feels like this is the perfect time to do it. Um, what was your decision making behind uh, retiring when you did? Um, you know, I kind of touched based on it a little bit, obviously getting cut from the pride really um, kind of destroyed my love for the game if if that doesn't sound depressing enough but um you know I, I kind of just felt like I had achieved everything I wanted to um you know, played overseas for uh, you know such a famous club throughout the entire world um you know was sponsored by Adidas for four years got some national team experience played for a few teams in the U.S. League um you know I felt like 
it was everything that I wanted to. And I started digressing and kind of going down and I didn't want to, um, keep going that direction. And so I kind of just felt like, you know what, um, you know, there is more to life than soccer. You know, I was 28 at the time. Um, I kind of wanted to just start focusing on, on building, uh, my career, um, outside of soccer. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never an easy decision by any means. Um, but as you said, there is life outside of soccer. It's sometimes hard. I feel like because most professional players, you know, they grow up wanting to be a professional player and from 12 to, you know, 18 years old, 20 years old, when they make their first professional cap, that's all they're working towards. And then when you're a professional player, it's almost like you have blinders on and all you do is train and prepare your body and heal and think about the next game. Um, and then you're done. And all of a sudden you're like, Whoa, wait, what? I'm 28 years old and now I have to figure out what I want to do with my life and where I'm going. And you know, your whole part of your identity shifts because now you're just a has been, so to speak, and no longer a professional player. Um, what was what was the process like for you? Um, I think mentally, I know I struggled with it a lot of of stopping playing and moving into coaching. So um, I can only imagine it was it was difficult and something that you had to kind of work through. Yeah, um, and to be honest, I don't I don't think I'll ever kind of get over it. Um, you know, not going to the stadium and suiting up and and you know, traveling to different cities, you know, getting ready for games, you know, it, I, I definitely miss it. Um, you know, looking back, I think the best, you know, piece of advice I can just even really give myself is just to remember all the good times that you had. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it is difficult, um, you know, being in that soccer world and, and, and knowing that you're not really fully in it anymore, um, you know, because it, it was my identity for 28 years of my life. So um, it, it's it's still taking some getting used to. But um, like I said, I I I accomplished so much in my my professional career, and um, you know now I'm just working on the next chapter of my life. Yeah, I think I think I said it last time, but it's like if you could have gotten your CV at the end of your career and shown it to you at 12 years old, I think you'd be very satisfied with all that you were able to accomplish. 100%. Um, what, what now is, is life looking like for you? What are you doing in your life? Um, yeah, so um, since I retired two years ago, I've done a few different things. Obviously, I finished my degree um, I've got into assist. I was an assistant athletic director at a high school in Orlando, Florida. Um, I got into some club coaching with Orlando City youth soccer, um, coached high school as well. Um, but within the past year, I've been doing marketing um, for Chipotle's Real Food for Real Athletes program. So it's a really exciting job. I get to go into all these different high schools in the Orlando area, different youth. Um, you know, club organizations, not just soccer, all different sports, and really um, try and pay it forward and speak to different athletes about nutrition and how it impacts their performance. So even though I'm not um, directly um, coaching, I'm still able to influence, um, you know, young youth players. So it's it's been a really exciting job. Yeah, and I mean, not, not saying coaching isn't important by any means, but I think it's <laughs> cool too because – I mean, you get to see so many different student athletes and not just soccer. And so your, your story, your perspective, your, you know, experiences and things you've learned along the way, you're able to share with a lot of different students, which I think is cool outside of just the soccer world. I have to ask, so what is your go-to Chipotle meal? Um, yeah, like I said, I, I'm not a picky eater, so if I go into the restaurant um, at Chipotle, I'll, I'll get something different. But typically, um, a bowl, a burrito bowl with um, rice, chicken, black beans, corn, mild salsa, and some lettuce. No uh, hot and cheese. And cheese. Um, no, I used, to, I used to really enjoy spicy food, and, and now I'm kind of just, um, just kind of a mild person. See, because... 
In, in Wisconsin, they say hot sauce is ketchup, so. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but that's, I mean, have you, you were coaching a little bit. You obviously decided to go um, in a different route. Is coaching something you would consider again in the future? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I just think obviously when I ended my career, um, I wasn't in a great place with the game. I think I just jumped into coaching because it was natural, you know, soccer is what I knew. Um, I just don't think that I was ready to start, um, investing my time for someone else in, in the game of soccer at that moment in my life, you know, showing up to soccer fields four, four nights a week and, traveling here and there all over Florida to, to help these young girls. Um, at that time in my life, I wasn't fully ready for that um, responsibility. Um, I didn't, you know, there was moments where I really did enjoy coaching. I really did um, love being able to help young girls understand the game better and, and to get better. But um, yeah, I just became too much for me at that moment in my life. So eventually um, I would love to get back um, into the game. And I'm sure those girls were uh, uh, blanking on the right word to use, but just overjoyed that their coach is a former national team player and professional player. Cause obviously like you growing up and playing in back at that time in, in soccer, you know, it was, Sometimes it was just like it's someone who had played a little bit of experience, didn't necessarily have playing experience, let alone, you know, a, a woman that's played for the national team. So I'm sure that was a cool experience for your players. Yeah, um, I would imagine that the girls were pretty excited. Um, one cool thing was some of the players would show me selfies that I had taken with them um, when I was playing for the Pride. So oh, it wow. kind of came back full circle and it was really cool to see. Good, good thing you uh, you took the time to take the selfies or something. <laughs> yeah. Now, just so you're just so you're clear, if you do go into coaching, uh, you're gonna start experiencing the coaching touch, which is when you go to you know you scored hundreds of goals in your career and you're gonna go up for an easy goal and just hit it right over the net. <laughs> yeah, I mean. It is what it is, right? I mean, I know I'm not going to be uh, tip-top shape, but um, all it takes is that one, like, perfect touch during a practice, and the kids are in awe and, and remember that. My advice is hold your run a, a little bit more next time. Okay. I'll <laughs> um, take that. What, if you could go back to 15-year-old you, you're diagnosed with cancer, you are, you know, trying to figure out what is going on in this world. Why is this happening to you? Soccer, you have no idea what's going to, what's going to come to pass with soccer at that time. What would be the advice now that you would give yourself at that point? Um, I think without a doubt, I would just tell myself that better days are ahead. Um, I think you kind of, we can kind of look at um, the pandemic that, everyone's going through right now right times are tough and and life's not great but it will get better and um you know as long as you have a positive outlook and and fight um great things are ahead i mean i didn't think that you know i was 15 years old and fighting for my life and all of a sudden eight years later i was um playing professional soccer so um pretty remarkable what I was able to do and um, hopefully that is kind of an inspiration for other people. 100%, 100%. Uh, do you have a favorite goal or two from your career? Um, probably the header that I had against Frankfurt in the cup final with Bayern. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other Big memorable goals. Uh, I only scored, I think, two with pride. Um, there, was, there was one that I scored against Hope Solo. Um, Alex Morgan crossed it in. Um, we were playing at the Citrus Bowl. Uh, so that was pretty, you know, memorable um, at the time. But um, I don't know, of course, you to really remember. Did you, did you ever talk to Alex Morgan about the uh, – did you tell her about the hate you got for taking her number? 
Um, I don't know if I ever brought that up to her or not. Um, yeah, I don't know. You should try to take her number at the Pride and see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that would go over too well either. Uh, have you uh, have you thought about in the future playing on any any co-ed leagues? Because I think it would be it would be funny if you play on a co-ed league and like you know it just starts out the game and then you just take over the game and then they find out they're playing as a former national team player. Um, I haven't. I've had a few you know coaches at Orlando City have asked, oh, you should play in our leagues on Sunday nights or whatever. Um, I haven't. Like I said, I have just taken a a pretty good step away from the game. Um, I may get into some of those co-ed leagues down the road. Um, when I was still playing, I'd come back home in the off season and, and play in some, some uh, indoor tournaments and whatnot. And it word got out pretty fast that, oh, this girl was just getting called into the national team. So um, it is kind of kind of funny how fast it travels, but uh, maybe someday I'll get back into playing again. Yeah. I hope so. What's uh, what's the biggest thing you miss about being a soccer player? Um, probably just the the girls that I've played with, um, showing up to the locker room every day and and you know traveling with them and just different people that you meet. You know, a lot of times, your teammates aren't necessarily the the people that you would choose to be friends with. You know, it forces you to um be friends with with people with different views and different lifestyles and um I just kind of miss that you know you always have someone who you can depend on and rely on um so I, I definitely miss that obviously you know showing up to the field on game days is having that like just kind of excitement within you um I miss that feeling but uh I mean so many different things yeah yeah it's hard to hard to just say one I'm sure well, I, I appreciate you taking time to, uh, to share your story again. Um, I, I think it's just an incredible story of from, you know, such a, a difficult obstacle to overcome at a young age to making it all the way to the ultimate, you know, dream of playing and representing your country at the senior level. So I know it, it didn't end exactly how you wanted. And I think that's, you know, a, another issue that, I appreciate you talking about with players is the dealing with when you're no longer the athlete and what that means, because it is, it is a grind to make it to professional soccer, but is another type of grind to no longer be a professional soccer player and what that encompasses. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story. Not a problem. It was fun uh, kind of reliving it and, and thinking back to the good times. So I appreciate it. Thank you. You have a good night. All right. You too. Bye.